Hello YouTube, this is Jay and we're going to start a series here on the most important shot in the game of pool, the break shot. Um, we're going to go through the most commonly used breaks in every game. Well, I say every game. I will show you breaks for three ball, six ball, eight ball, nine ball, ten ball, uh, straight pool, um, and rotation. Uh, I'm going to show you the most commonly used breaks in each of those games, not all in this video. Uh, I'm going to uh, talk about the break, talk about how it works, why it works, when you should use it, um, and when you shouldn't use it. I'm going to talk about the prerequisites, what's important for that break. I'm going to talk about all of the pieces of a break. We're going to do in-depth analysis of each break commonly used in each game. Um, this is going to span on for a while. So, uh, of course, I'm a nine ball player. So we'll be starting with nine ball breaks. Um, I have a video that I did a while back called Mechanics of the Break. Um, and that talks about the actual, how you use the cue, how you bridge, how you want to strike the ball. Um, and it also talks about adjustments. Uh, and we're, adjustments is a big thing when you're talking about the break. Um, the break we're going to start with is one that's used quite frequently now. Um, it is a break that is designed to pocket the wing ball and uh, roll the one up the table and control the cue to have a shot on the one. Now, uh, I will tell you that this break, um, for example, in the China Nine Ball Open 2019, uh, Corey Duell played Fedor Gorse. Fedor Gorse? I'm sorry if I mispronounce that name. Um, Fedor won nine to five. That means there were 14 breaks in that tournament. That, the break that they were using, um, they were both using a, a version of this break that I'm going to show you. Uh, and they both stuck to it even though it wasn't paying off. Um, the break actually worked twice in the tournament, the way that it was supposed to. Um, I think there were two times it worked the way it was supposed to. There were two scratches. There were, and I'm doing this from memory, so I may be able to go off. Um, so it worked the way it was supposed to twice. It worked the way it was supposed to, but scratched twice. Um, Corey did make an adjustment to it, and I'll show you what his adjustment was when we're talking through the adjustment part of this break. Uh, and the, uh, the rest of the time, the break either did not pocket a ball or ended up with the player leaving themselves safe after the break, um, or, or in a place where they had to play safe pretty, pretty quickly after the break. Um, I take it back, it, it worked three times. So three times good, two times scratch, both Corey Duel, uh, and the other nine times did not work. Um, Corey adjusted, uh, and after he adjusted, he had better results. Uh, Fedor did not, um, and ultimately uh, the match came down to a, uh, a battle post-break. Uh, so I will link that video down below so you can see what I'm talking about. <clears throat> this is the break that they were using. Um, so to start out with, uh, Let's, let's talk really quickly about the rules of racking and the rules of breaking. Um, so there are two major rule sets uh, and there are slight variations on each rule set. Um, so WPA, uh, the WPA rule set is for, for a nine ball break is that uh, the one ball must be struck first. You must either pocket a ball or drive three balls past the head string. And if you don't know what the head string is, it's this line right here. It's the second diamond up on the table. Um, 
So three balls past the head string or pocket a ball. If you do not, the incoming player, the one, uh, the, the other player, the non-breaking player gets to come up and decide whether they want to shoot it uh, or if they want you to shoot. Um, and I believe there's also an option to re in there for WPA. Uh, I'll have to look at that one. Um, <clears throat> the other rule set is Texas Express. Um, so a little bit of history, way back in the day, uh, nine ball was a two shot foul game. What that meant was that the incoming player, when they started each shot, had the option of shooting at the ball or they could push out, just like we do after the break right now. Um, and, and all of these games are push after the break, um, all rule sets <coughs> currently. Uh, but but in the, back in the day, you could push on every shot. And then the incoming player had the choice of shooting from where you push to or uh, or shooting at the ball or giving it, I'm sorry, had the option of shooting to where you push to, from where you push to, or they could give it back to you and on the second time you shot in a row, uh, you if you didn't hit the ball it was foul. Um, so two shot foul. Uh, the problem with that is that the game was way too long. Um, a game of nine ball, a single rack of nine ball could take hours. Um, it was very strategic. Uh, even almost, I, I could argue that it was more strategic than straight pool, but it wasn't really good for the game in gaining popularity uh, because these long safety battles and this long push back and forth thing resulted in uh, matches that were way too long for TV. They were way way too long for spectators to sit and watch. Um, the, if you ever go to a pool hall, there's usually one or two people sitting on the side that just watch the game constantly. Uh, the rail birds, as they're called. Uh, and effectively, they would be the only people that would enjoy that game. So Texas Express was an association that came together and put together rules to make the game move faster. And their rules are what, for a long time, were the de facto rules for nine ball, and they still are. So tech, when I say Texas Express, I'm talking about Texas Express rules, I'm talking about APA League, BCA League, UPA Leagues. Um, many of the major tournaments still use Texas Express rules. Um, and, and so for the break, Texas Express rules are you must drive four balls to a rail or pocket a ball. Okay, so... Um, The break that I'm going to show you meets both the WPA and the Texas Express rules. Um, <clears throat> now let's talk about the prerequisites for this break. Um, this is this is a softer break. Uh, it is one that um, is designed to pocket the wing ball and to where did I put it? So let's talk about racking. So in racking, nine ball, all of the rules are the same. The one ball goes on top, the nine ball goes in the middle, and the rest of the balls are in random order. And that's very important, especially with today with Magic Rack where you have good control over where the balls are going to fall. Um, if you rack what they call pattern racking, which means that you are racking deliberately to put certain balls in certain areas of the table, um, that's actually a foul. And it's actually a match losing foul in some tournaments. So, for example, we know that if you have the two ball on the bottom of the rack, with a frozen rack, we know exactly where that two balls go. Okay, so with pattern racking, we know that if I put the two ball back here on the opposite back corner and I break with any kind of any kind of power break uh, or solid break, not not the soft break, but solid breaks, and we will talk about soft breaks too that if I do this, 
that two ball is going to ride out in front of that back corner pocket every time. Okay? You know the one ball comes to this end of the table every time, right? Uh, or it falls in the side pocket. Those are the only two choices for the one ball. And it does that every time and it's controllable and we know that it does that. So in pattern macking, the idea is that you place balls where you know where they're going to go. So we know for a fact, because it happens every single time, that if you side break, the one ball goes up to the top of the table. We know that. That happens every time from a side break. It does not necessarily happen from a center break, but it does happen from a side break. Okay? So we know that one ball's either going to go in the side or it's going to hit the rail close to the side and roll down generally in this direction. And because my table is so tight and so fast, it doesn't grab on the rail and go to the corner like it does on many tables. It actually runs down in here. Um, we know that. That's going to happen. Well, we also know that we make the wing ball every time, right? So if we're making the two in here and the one's up there, then it's to our advantage to get the three ball down there as well. And so if we rack it, we can, we can sit here and adjust the position of the three ball until we find out which one sends the three down to this end. Okay, so you see that the three and the eight both come down here. Okay, so now if I'm pattern racking, the way that I'm doing that is I know that the three and the eight went down here, right? So I put the one on top, of course. Um, we put the three here. We put the four here. We put the two on the wing. And then the others can just go in. Okay, so now what we've got here is a pattern rack, okay? You've got four balls, one, two, three, four, that will end up at this end of the table. I'm sorry, you have three balls that will end up at that end of the table. The one, the three, the four, and if you remember, the, eight, the uh, five ball was up there too, so we'll just go ahead and put that back on its wing. Okay, so now, this rack should, if I break it the same way I just broke, uh, without the scratch, um, the one ball should end up up here somewhere. The two ball is gonna go in the wing. The three ball is gonna end up up here. The four ball is going to end up up here and the five ball is going to end up up here. Okay? So, is that right? The eight and the five ended up. There's three ball, where's the three ball? Let's switch these two. We want to guarantee the three balls up there, and I think the five was, and I don't think the three was. So just to be safe, we're gonna rack the three on that on that one. Okay, so in theory, what we should have is the two balls should go in, the one, the three, and the four should end up up at this end of the table. The five might end up at that end of the table. I think it actually ends up up here. Uh, the six, seven, and eight. Seven comes straight across and out. The eight runs to the end rail. And the six, um, I believe the six hit here, here, and up here. Okay, so we should, we're, we're now controlling the positions of all the balls. Okay, well, we made, the, we made the one, which we actually didn't want to do. But you see, the three, the four, and five are here. The six is about where I predicted. The seven is where I predicted. The eight did not go where I predicted. It actually came down and up. But you see how we controlled the rack? We predicted accurately what area each ball was going to be in. Doing that is illegal. Watch out for it. If you see this happening all the time with your opponent, where they're getting Early balls up here, late balls down here. They're pattern racking, call them on.
Um, in tournaments, not in, in tournaments with referees, it's not an issue because the referee is racking and you have no control over that. But you see how, and, and by the way, if your opponent's racking and you're finding that the one's up there, the two's there, the three's there, the four's there, the five's there, and you're going back and forth across the table all the time, they're pattern racking you defensively. Um, and uh, Mike Siegel even talks about that in, in his breaking video, his nine ball breaking video, um, how to place balls so that they have the odds of having being split across the table make you shoot back and forth on the table. It is much easier to play a half table pattern here, have a transition ball, and then play a half table pattern here than it is to play full table patterns where you have to go all the way across, all the way back, all the way up, all the way down. Um, so, in, if you see pattern racking, call the person on it. It is illegal, uh, and it's actually in tournaments many times a, uh, it's considered cheating, it's an unsportsmanlike, uh, which in some tournaments is a warning and then a, then a, a uh, forfeiture of the game and then a forfeiture of the match. Um, in some tournaments, it's an automatic forfeiture of the match. Okay, so let's talk about that break. Um, so this is the break we're going to talk about. And I am going to pattern rack in order so you can see where everything ends up. So I am going to be doing this. One, two, three, four, nine, five, six, seven, eight. Just so we can see where the balls end up from their various positions in the rack. All right, so. This break, let's talk about when to use it. So first of all, this break I'm about to do requires the balls to be frozen. And if you go watch that video uh, that, uh, that I linked below to the China nine ball open, um, you will see both players, even though they're using a device similar to a magic rack, it's actually a circle with lines coming off of it, um, but it works the same way as a magic rack. You'll see both players coming up and doing this. And Corey comes over and does it from this side quite often. Okay, and what they're doing is they're looking to make sure everything's frozen that needs to be frozen. Now, for this break to work, seven balls have to be frozen. The other two don't matter. Okay, so for this break to actually work, seven balls have to be frozen. And it doesn't matter what kind of rack is being used. It doesn't matter if it's magic rack, that circle rack thingy that they were using in China, the Sardo perfect rack, or a wood rack. If a person puts a wood rack up and these seven balls are frozen, you can use this break from this side. Okay? So it is the top six balls plus the ball below the nine. Uh, on the side that you're breaking from. So if I'm going to, going to break from that side, which is where Corey was breaking, you will see that the requirement is that it's frozen on that side. Now, why is that last ball required? Because we have two goals with this break. With this break, we want to pocket the wing ball, and we want to, well, three goals. We want to pocket the wing ball, we want the one ball to come off the rail and up to the top of the table, and we want the cue ball to come up somewhere where it's got a shot on one. So if the one ball is going over there, you want the cue ball over here. If it's coming over here, you want the cue ball over here, okay? Um, this is a very high percentage break, okay? But it requires the rack to be frozen. <clears throat> um, again, the, two, the, the only one of the back three that has to be frozen for it to work is the ball behind the wing ball. And it, that has to be frozen in order to give the wing ball a chance to go in pocket. Okay, prerequisite number two. So if you look at the tangent line, okay, the tangent line, if you remember, is you draw a line through the center of the two balls and then you draw a line on a 90 degree angle. Okay? So, the tangent line between the wing ball that you're going to pocket and the ball behind it has to be between 
It has to be more, more than one inch from the pocket, and it has to be less than three inches from the pocket. It has to be more than one inch and less than three. If it's not, the wing ball will not go in. So why does it have to be pointed here? We know that it's in theory that if you were to hit the four and the rest of that wasn't here, the, the edge of the four would follow that tangent line and the four ball would hit right about here. Okay? It would follow the tangent line and the ball would make contact right about here. Okay, the reason that it has to be up here is because with the brake, so first of all, we're going to be using draw on this, okay? And draw backspin imparts forward spin on the ball it hits, which is the one ball. And that reverses and reverses, okay? So the two ball is going to have kind of sort of a backspin motion, uh, and the four ball is going to pick up top spin, okay? So you've got momentum going this way, which is pushing everything in that direction. And then you've got the spin on top of that pushing in that direction. Now, the spin doesn't really affect the board all that much, just a tiny amount. It's that momentum that pushes the board in the pocket. So, tangent line greater than one inch, less than three inches. Okay, so, so it needs to be pointed somewhere in this little box. Um, now, this is a great break for a table with tight pockets, like mine or like the ones played at tournaments. If you're playing on a table that has looser pockets, so these pockets are, are four and a quarter inches wide. If you're playing on a table with five inch pockets, or if the points of the pockets are angled to help the ball into the side pockets, you do not want to use this break because we do not want to sink the one ball. Um, in fact, if you watch that video, you will see a place where uh, uh, where Corey, get, I believe it's Corey that does it, he sinks the one ball in the side and you can see that he's visibly angry at having made the one ball because now he's got no shot on the next ball. So you'll, you'll see that. Um, we do not want to pocket the one ball. Okay, so now what's the placement? Cue ball about a ball's distance or less. Um, the, fur the closer you move to the center, the less likely this is to work. Um, but you, I use my regular break position for this. Okay, where are we aiming? Or what, what English are we using? Well, we're using draw, okay? Um, now, we're not using a huge amount of draw. We're using about a tip, one tip of draw. And I'll put that up on the ball up here. Um, what, you, what you're going to try to do is you're going to try to hit the one on the side, the cue ball comes over to the rail and out to the center of the table. Um, the four ball goes in uh, and presumably you have a shot from, from the cue somewhere out here in the center of the table, preferably on this side because the one's going to be over here on most tables. Now for me, like I said, because my table's brand new, it's slick and everything, the one ball usually ends up over here, so I play it a little differently for a shot here. But I'll, I'll try and show you what it should look like. Um, now, initial aiming point. So when you're aiming at the rack, okay, I've heard people say aim at the diamond. I've heard try to cut the one in the corner or cut the one to the diamond or cut the one to one inch from the diamond. Don't do that. Forget about that. That's a horrible way to think about aiming at the rack. The way to aim at the rack is there are all these different places in the rack that you can see points on. Okay, so if I'm down here and I'm aiming, I can aim at the five ball, I can aim at the seven ball, I can aim at the crack between, which is what we're going to do. I can aim, uh, I can aim for all kinds of different reference points here. And I'm going to show you those. So you can see there are a bunch of different things that you can aim at here. You've got you can aim at the seven ball, you can aim at the five ball, you can aim at the three, you can aim at the, a full hit on the one, you can aim for the valley between the one and the two at the top, or the valley at the one and the two at the bottom. You can aim at the left edge of the one, the left edge of the three, the left edge of the five. You can aim for the valley between the one and the nine. You can aim for the place where the five and the three come together. Um, all of these are 
different aiming points and each of them has a different outcome of the break. So the reference point that we want to start practicing this break with is the point in between the five and the seven. So when you're down aiming, you're not aiming at the one, you're aiming at the point between the five and the seven that you can see above the rack. and you can see it. And so I had top English, English on that by mistake. You can see the one ball came down there about where I said it would go. Um, if my table had more grab in the rails, it would have ended up down here near this eight ball, uh, which is where you'll find it ends up on most tables. And you have a very easy shot at it from here. Okay, so. That's the way the shot is supposed to work. You're supposed to end up with the one ball coming off the rail and coming out here. My rails are wound a little bit tight um, and they're, they're freshly recovered, so they're skidding a little bit. But this is what you should end up with on that break. And you can try it. Try it. It's, it's, it's fairly straightforward. Now, if you... So, so... The idea is to have a controllable break that gives you a shot on the one. And then from there, you know, I can draw or I can come off the rail and over here, shoot the two down, shoot the three down, a little bit of draw, shoot the five on the side, stop it, six in that corner, uh, just stop it there, seven in this corner, cue ball comes off the rail for the eight, hit the eight, come back up the table here to shoot the nine in that corner. This is a fairly straightforward pattern to play, okay? Now, it, it requires you to make some balls, and it requires you to control the cue pretty well, but you can see from here, this should be a runnable rack for every pro. Every pro should run this rack every time. It's wide open. Now, mistakes happen, control issues happen, um, Tables aren't, at, at tournaments, they try to level the tables, but sometimes they settle. Sometimes you have, you know, it rolls off. Uh, yeah. And they will try to fix it, but that doesn't help you in the game where you find out that it rolled off. Um, that game still counts. They don't give the game back because, they don't stop the game, they don't give the game back because it was rolled. Um, so, that's the break, and, it, and it's repeatable. Um, and I actually hit that harder than they normally do. Uh, I'm gonna hit it a little softer this time so you can see the difference in what happens. And I'm gonna use draw this time. So this is the break. You can see the one ball is running towards the pocket. The ball came out to the center of the table, kind of sucks that I ended up with shooting over the three. But again, you can see it was doing what it's supposed to do, and that draw is helping to get it to that corner. Um, it's giving it a flatter angle into the rail, which is allowing me to grab more. So, and we made both the four and the five, which is funny. Uh, that's, those were the two wing balls. But you can see how this could be a controllable break. Um, you can Okay, one other condition here. Um, if the balls are dirty, this break is not a great break. If the balls are dirty, this is not a great break. Um, this is really a tournament break more than a pool hall break. So pool halls typically have bigger pockets. Uh, they don't always have tournament quality tables with small, tight pockets. Um, very few of them Let's talk about adjustments, okay? So what are the adjustments that I did? Uh, well, so the first time I broke out, I had some top English on it. It didn't end up anywhere near where I wanted it to be. Um, the last several racks, the, uh, the last several racks, I had uh, bottom English on it. I had too much bottom, I backed off the bottom now. The next thing you can affect is your point of aim. And 
Uh, what you can do with that is the only thing you want to do with your point of aim is either change where the one ball's going or where the cue ball's going. So, if I hit full up, which is what Corey chose to adjust to in the match, then the cue ball does more of the traditional bounce out and, and sit out here kind of thing. Um, the one ball tended into the side pocket when he did that. So his, his, break, his change in his break caused the one ball not to run down the table. Instead, it caused the one ball to fall on the side. And the four was still falling in the side, or the ball in the position the four's in, was still falling in the corner. Uh, and the cue ball was coming to the center of the table. It was more of a traditional break, but it but hit softer. Um, and he was still hitting it with just a little bit of bottom English. Something like this. Okay. Uh, now, on that break, what I did is I changed my point of aim from the, the crease between the uh, not uh, the three and five, I changed my point of aim to the full ball one, okay? Now, if I hit that a little softer, I probably have a better chance to shot, um, and that's one of those things you can control. Now, this is a harder break to control uh, because you have to, you still have to hit it hard enough to make the one uh, and the four uh, in deeper spread. You don't want to hit it so soft that the balls all end up against the rails. That would be a bad, bad day. Um, so, if the brake's not working when you're aiming at the crease, shift your point of aim. And, and aiming full, fully at the one ball is always a good option. Okay. Uh, and, and you'll notice I'm not ramping up the power or, or lowering the power. I'm talking about adjustments. Now, if I aim at the seven, Okay, now I'm gonna hit about a quarter ball on the one. And you can see that's that's a scratch. Okay, so what can I do? How can I adjust this? Well, okay, so you know that the seven is too far. Okay, and you, you practice this on your own because it's gonna be a little different for you than it is for me. Your stroke is by definition different from my stroke. No matter how much we try to focus on fundamentals and try to replicate things, the way that you do it and the way I do it are always going to be at least slightly different. Did I say aim at the seven? I meant the five. Or maybe I had the seven in the five position for some reason. Um, I think I had the seven in the five position. No, 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 the seven was right. It was, it was back here. In the, all right, so um, so my, my aiming point is between the five and the eight, right? That's my starting place. Now, I know that if I shoot directly at the eight, that's a scratch in this corner. We know that. So, what I have to, so that tells me my outer bounds of aim is, is, has to be less than. What if I aim at the five? What happens then? Now I'm aiming to hit the five full. Okay. So I had some top English on that. That might be a viable break if I hit it with bottom English to keep the cue ball out in the center of the table. That actually could be a really good break if I keep the, the uh, cue ball out at the center of the table. The other, the other thing you want to do when you're breaking, by the way, you want to notice when you're practicing, you want to notice where everything's going. Um, so if I use that break, it takes the ball in this position and moves it up there. Now if you remember, on the other break, the ball in this position went over here. So I can look at the rack and say, where's the one, where's the two, and choose my break based on what I want the two to do. Does that make sense? I have not seen a lot of pros doing that. It's a lot of stuff to remember. You have to remember all your breaks and all the different ways that it happens. But as a general rule, I can 
memorize some certain positions and say, okay, well, if I see the rack here, okay, if I see the two ball rack here, then I want to use, I want to shoot at the ball opposite. Okay, I want to aim at the ball opposite. Okay, um, with a little bit of draw. Let's do a little bit of draw and see what it does. Well, I don't like that. Um, I don't like that because you see we got two different clusters. Now that's just a function of speed, different speed, different outcome. Um, hit it softer or hit it harder. But anyhow, you make those adjustments. Anyhow, so when to use? So first of all, let's talk about the exact break. So, to summarize this break, this break is designed for tight tables, frozen rack, again, seven balls need to be frozen, the top six plus either the six or the seven position, depending on which side you're breaking from. Breaking from this side, it's six, breaking from that side, it's the seven. I uh, don't care about the other two balls. Okay. Uh, the Aiming point that you want to start with is that valley between the five and the seven. Okay, five, five ball position and the seven ball position. So between the wing and the ball behind it, on the opposite side. You're going to adjust to the left and to the right uh, based on your results. So if you're hitting and the one ball is going over there like it's supposed to, great. Um, and the wing ball is going in, great. Now again, tangent line, four ball, has to be lined up to hit more than an inch, less than three inches. Uh, that will put it into the pocket. That will guarantee you, po you pocket it as long as it's frozen. Um, it's a medium speed break. One tip of bottom English, uh, that will help get your one ball over here and it will also help hold the cue ball up. Uh, if it's not working, minor adjustments up to almost a full ball on the seven as an aiming point and up to a full ball on the five as an aiming point. Um, you want to make minor adjustments until you find what works for you. All right, and so that's today's break. Um, if you have questions, please put them below. If you like what you see, hit like, hit, hit subscribe, hit the notification bell. And we will see you next time. All right, just for general purposes, I'm going to mix these balls up. I'm going to shuffle the balls so I get a random order and don't end up putting them back there. trying to order these balls in any way, shape, or form. They're just going wherever they go. And let's, let's play a few and see how we do with running using this break. All right, so let's do a quick sample of how this break works percentage-wise. I'm gonna do 10 breaks. Let's see how many of them. I have a shot on one and I have made the wing ball. Looks like Corey's breaks during the China Open. By the way, Corey Duell is a great guy. He's, he's a true consummate professional. Um, I've, I've met him a few times. I've never played against him, uh, but I, I will tell I, you know I met him at the U.S. Open and uh, he also came to a one pocket tournament at CM's place where I used to play uh, and I was back playing three cushion billiards with some guys and Corey came over and said hey can I try this how does it work and uh, the guys that were actually on the table at the moment I was on the rail 
um, waiting for my turn. Uh, the guys that were actually playing let him step up and play, and he ran, he ran like eight right off the bat with no no issues. And um, with his stroke and his English and his knowledge of the game, it was actually pretty easy for him. He's he is an innovator. Corey is an innovator, and uh, you know they named the break the soft break after him. Uh, and we will be doing detail on that break as well. Uh, but good guy, uh, seemed nice enough when I met him. Uh, didn't really hang out with him or anything like that, but uh, he's, a, he's a class act, he's a true professional. All right, so I'm gonna break these 10 times and let's see what happens. See how many of them I do my goal. Remember my goal is make the wing ball, one ball to this end of the table, cue ball with a shot on the one. Okay. Not the greatest shot on the one, but definitely a shot on the one. I can make the one there, come off the rail and out for the three, and then it should be a run from there. All right, that's one. One good one. Okay, pocketed the wing ball, but we don't have a really good shot on the one. It's makeable, but we did not end up in a good position for it. So I'm gonna call that a no, no non-shot. So that, that did not work the way we wanted it to. That's one for two. Now, don't get me wrong. I would be perfectly happy getting that outcome in the tournament uh, because I could see the one and, and either take that, that tougher shot or play safe off of it. Uh, but that's not our goal. Our goal is make the wing, bring the one up the table, bring the cue ball back down, uh, preferably to the center. I'm probably still hitting this too hard. Um, but uh, bring, bring the one ball down the table towards this half of the table, bring the cue ball out and get a shot on the one and make the wing. And that's what, that's our goal. So one for two so far. Okay, that's just unlucky. Um, but I do still have a shot on the one. I can either cut the thin cut in the side or I can put it down here and roll it in slow with top English so that the cue ball doesn't scratch. Uh, so that's, I'm going, to, I'm going to call that a success. We have a shot on the one, and the two all went in. So two for three. Okay, unlucky. We're still hitting this tip, uh, which means I need more draw, or less draw. No, I need more draw. Um, so. Not a great shot on the one. Would I take it in a tournament, of course, but not <clears throat> not a valid try. So we're two for four so far, 50%. Okay, there we go. That's what it was, not enough draw. We miss our wing ball, it's two for five. And there we go. That looks good to me. That is three, three for five. And four for six. And so far I would call this zero actual failures. Zero sellouts. Which is just as important. Okay, I aimed that badly. Uh, so that was me aiming badly. We had a shot on the one. It's not a great shot. This is going to go in the uh, not a success but not a failure category. Um, so four for seven with three that are playable. And I will be very clear, I missed on my aim that time. I hit the one ball almost dead on. Four for seven. Far out. That's right. 
Okay, not enough draw. This is unplayable. Now, I, it's playable, but for purposes of the way that I'm grading this break, that's unplayable. Because you don't have a way to make the one other than the bag. So, with no way to make the ball at all, that's, that's an unplayable. So we're, we're now four for eight with three that were playable and one that's unplayable. Then you... That, one worked, that one worked exactly like it's supposed to, but I think we're hooked. No, it's maple. So that's five for nine. I just want to see. Yeah, so it's, it was me with a leap. So five for nine. Uh, so we did not accomplish our goal. This falls in the playable category because we did make a ball. Um, and we do have a shot on the one, but we did not make our wing ball, which was our actual goal. So, five, four, and one is the, is the result of that. So ultimately, that was five, four, and one. Uh, which means, 50% of the time, it should be just a run. 40% of the time, there might be a tough shot on the one, that you may opt to save or you may opt to try to shoot. Um, and then 10% of the time you have no choice. So 10% of the time you gave up the table. So those odds are actually pretty good. Um, this is a solid break if you have the conditions. And that's today's break. In the next one, we'll do another nine ball break. We're going to go through all the, all the major nine ball breaks. There's only three or four of them five of them, uh, so that uh, we can continue forward and kind of keep them grouped together. Um, I'm going to put these in a playlist of its own. Subscribe to the playlist if you want to, uh, and we'll talk to you later.